All right, on today's episode of Gramercy Reading Club, we're back, back, back in the studio, uh, of course, with your founder and host, Brian Shankman, uh, co-host Steve Prosperity, back on the podcast, and we have our really good friend, Zach Linane, um, jumping on as well. Um, and today we're talking about uh, a really fun book, a really funny read, a quick read, um, and, and a read that's really um, kind of pertinent to what's going on um, in, in culture right now with, with this one movie called The Room. Um, so the book we're, we're discussing today is called The Disaster Artist, um, My Life Inside the Room, The Greatest Bad Movie Ever Made, written by Greg Sestero and co-written by Tom Bissell. Essentially, and I'll read the back of the book so you guys can hear it verbatim, but what this book is about is inside the making of what is really considered the worst movie ever, but celebrated for that. Imagine um, people made Jurassic Park, and Jurassic Park was the worst movie ever, and then someone in Jurassic Park wrote a book called The Making of Jurassic Park. That's essentially what is happening with this book here. The guy, guy uh, Greg Sestero, stars in the movie alongside his friend um, Tommy, and he kind of writes like, you know, how did how did this movie come to be? How did it come to see the light of day? And, and this is what the info inside pamphlet says. Nineteen-year-old Greg Sestero met Tommy Wiseau at an acting school in San Francisco. Wiseau's scenes were rivetingly wrong, yet Sestero thought, "I have to do a scene with this guy." That impulse changed both of their lives. Wiseau asked Sestero to co-star with him in The Room, a movie Wiseau wrote, financed, produced, and directed, in the parking lot of a Hollywood equipment rental shop. Wiseau spent $6 million of his own money on his film, but The Room made only $1,800 at the box office and closed after just two weeks. One reviewer said that watching The Room was like, quote, getting stabbed in the head. The Disaster Artist is Greg Sestero's laugh-out-loud funny account of how Tommy Wiseau defined, sorry, defied every law of artistry, business, and friendship to make the citizen cane of bad movies, which is now an international phenomenon. Written with an award-winning journalist, Tom Bissell, The Disaster Artist is an inspiring tour de force that reads like a page-turning novel, an open-hearted portrait of an enigmatic man who will probably capture your heart who will improbably capture your heart. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that really sums up the book really well. This guy, Greg, he's a young actor in Hollywood trying to make it, and he meets this this overly confident, maybe European, older guy named Tommy Wiseau who's, who's super out there, and, and through through meeting him, they create this really unlikely bond, and, and really the culmination of this friendship and bond is this crazy, hilarious, um, horrible, objectively, but great in its own ways. Um, movie, The Room, which I recommend you watch, um, and and dig into this book. You know, this book's cool. It's a multimedia experience. Um, you have the book, you have the movie, um, and yeah, me, Steve, and Zach really really dive into it um, uh, in this podcast. So, without further ado. <laughs> Two boys here, Steve Prosperi. How you doing? Doing good. Thanks for coming back. After you shot the first episode, I thought like you might just bail. <laughs> not not but not anything to do with you, but like it was like wow, we just did that, and I can't believe we're gonna do it again. You know, so uh, thanks. I thought for about it. Marcel kept me here. Thanks again to Marcel. Yeah, shout out Marcel. Mar Anytime. Um, special guest, yo. Honestly, this is crazy. We got my boy Zach Lenane. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. How's it feel to be on a podcast? Uh, it's a long time dream. It's kind of like a long time listener, first time caller. Big podcast head here. Big podcast. First time participating. Okay. What uh, type of what type of podcast do you like? Oh, lots of stuff, man. I sports podcast. I listen to a lot of music podcasts. A lot, a lot of music politics. Ones. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've got like a, I got like a feed of like twenty five or so that I. You got a, you got a gamut of options. Yeah, I'm updating every day. I'm trying to adjust my chair, but it's not working. Um. All right, man. Well, welcome. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. I'm excited to have you. It's I think so. You kind of so we're all in a book club together, right? Yeah, Correct. D does everyone know that? Is that part of the? It's kind of it's kind of like a known thing. All right. Um, we're all in a book club together, which is kind of the inspiration for this one. Um, on today's episode, we're going to be discussing the Disaster Artist mm -hmm. um, by Greg Sestro, who really you know stars in a movie that is pretty much the worst movie ever, called The Room. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about? The Disaster Artist. And other quick note, next time we meet, um, we're going to be discussing Sapiens by Dr. Yuval Harari. Um, so if you're watching this and you want to stay tuned and keep 
um, track with us, uh, Sapiens. We'll, we'll put the link in the show notes and um, comments, etc. But yeah, talk to us about The Disaster Artist. What's this book about? All right. So the book is about the making of the movie The Room. Okay. Directed, starred, produced, edited by Tommy Wiseau. Um, and so I, I became familiar with the movie um, probably three or four years ago. I just had like found it on the internet and read it or something. They're like, this is movie's hilarious. You gotta watch it. And I watched it, and you know, thought I watched it with, by myself and thought it was like fantastic. Like, it, just a unique, interesting, at the very least, interesting movie experience. And then I watched it one more time, probably two, a year and a half ago, with a whole bunch of other people, like just hanging out. And it was, you know, absolutely a great time because you, you're watching with people and you didn't. I, having already seen the movie, was like pointing out things to other people and, and everyone was cracking up. Well, and that's right. a big thing too, right? When you have like a movie you think is really funny and you like show it to a group of people and you're kind of like, so you're like not really watching the movie, right? You're watching right. your friends watch the movie and like, do they yeah. think it's funny? Yeah, so every big every big moment in the movie, I'm like turned around looking at all the people watching the movie. But, you guys are yeah. laughing, right? Right, and so then what's happened now is that the, the movie has become famous enough on its own that they're making, or before that even, the guy who stars besides the, beside the creator and you know, brain genius Tommy Wiseau is the guy Greg Sestero, mm-hmm. and he decides to write a book. And the book is actually a couple I years old. I really said now. that last name wrong, didn't I? Sestero? Sestero, Sestero? Is how I would say. Sestro? Sestro. Sestro. And Tom Bissell, him. too. Yeah, Tom Bissell is. Who, he, he's Tom written Bissell? a couple of books, too. He's, I think, a journalist, but he also. Um, he wrote the. He wrote, oh, he's the co writer. He wrote yeah. the script to the second Gears of War game, I read. <laughs> That's weird. So, so Disaster Artist is written by Greg Sestero, who was the co star of the movie, okay. and Tom Bissell, who was. A professional writer who I guess co-wrote and gave him guidance and stuff like that, and it's about you know the relationship between Greg and Tommy, and also the the torrential uh, production of the movie itself, and how that all went down. And it it's it was a, it was a good read. And then now since then they've James Franco has picked up the movie, and is now making a feature length film that is the the book about the movie. So you know a movie about a book about a movie. It's Classic. meta. When meta you first term. brought it up, okay, so that's not the book I was thinking of, but. Extra lives. Mm. Anyway, uh, I'm thinking a documentary about video games. So when you so when you first brought, it was your choose to put. We so said we do round robin in our book club, and it was your ch- your turn to choose. Right. Yeah. And when you brought it up, it was very meta, and I had never. Mm-hmm. I thought you were talking about room where the woman's right. trapped in the shed. Yeah, that's what, I was that's confused, a, but a, a more a recent you know confusion that's been put up on top of this thing because that's a great movie itself. Fire movie. Um, you have to, the, the, and the distinction is whether it's the room or room. Mm-hmm. Well, so and one's a great movie, and the other one is the greatest worst movie. Yeah, right? so both worth watching, I would say. I think so. I talked to my friends or whatever about this book, and I, I think a good analogy, just to make it very simple, is imagine people. Imagine that there's Jurassic Park, and Jurassic Park was the worst movie ever. This book would be called The Making of Jurassic Park. Right, that's the Disaster Artist movie that's coming out. Right, so the movie coming out, James Franco and Dave Franco, is inside. The making of Jurassic Park. If Jurassic Park was the worst movie ever, right? So, Love like the Franco brothers. Yeah, with the Franco. So, uh, throw it out there. explain the room. Like, why is it the worst movie ever? I mean, I keep saying um, it's like bad or great, but it's it's like it's really a lot of it has to do with Tommy and how and this guy Tommy Wiseau and how just a, of a strange character he is and and, and he, the performance he gives in the movie itself, like sort of tears between like just him not really knowing how to act and <laughs> obviously that being funny on its own, but then him also having like crazy ideas about how he he is as an actor and, and all the things that he thinks are sort of uh he's putting into his work so the things from his life that have are, are, are coming through when he's acting those are bizarre in their own way mm-hmm. and that sort of, sort of comes together to make like a crazy performance and you can tell the people that are around him are like kind of don't really know how to act around him and they're sort of coming in and out and uh and th- but then there's all these other crazy decisions that he makes um in the production side that also you don't necessarily know when you're watching the movie, but then are kind of explained later on, and then they, they kind of make sense. And then if you have have the experience of watching the movie with also the, all the stuff that's in the book, uh, there's a whole other layer of things that you can see that are that are also pretty funny to watch. Yeah, I think the production, the acting is crazy in itself. The storyline is crazy, but the things he does to burn cash from a production standpoint right. are insane. And so what, what's he do? He shoots the entire movie with two cameras. One is 35 millimeter film, and the other is like an HD camera. Right. Which in, whenever this was shot was you know early 2000s was like eighty thousand dollar camera. Right. So that yeah. So that's all. That's for people who don't know that, that doesn't happen. You don't shoot with two cameras. You, so you, sh- you shoot with one camera. Shoot with one camera, and so every shot is like 
is like six inches off center because they, they had to make room in the in the <laughs> in the lift for for the for both cameras like to fit side on the side, side yeah. by side. So they're so no one's shooting directly on the way you would normally shoot it. They're all you know either six inches to the left or the right. Um, yeah, he's got all these crazy ideas because he he wants it to be a, a quote unquote real Hollywood movie. And he, he, this this real Hollywood production. This real Hollywood movie. It's real Hollywood. Big movie. time. Big time. <laughs> His accent's hilarious, and uh, yeah, and yeah. and it's so like indistinguishable. Like, where's he from? Oh yeah, it's it's we untraceable. Don't know, do we? I mean, it, it might be like two or three accents put on top of each other. Because if you believe the story that is in the book, is that he's from Eastern Europe and then spent a whole bunch of time in France, and then from there moved to America, and he's definitely is obsessed with America. So I I could see a situation in which he's got his you know Polish or whatever he's from accent. On, with the French accent on top of that, and then trying to do like an American affect. Well, he's trying to overcompensate too, right? Because he's yeah. trying to be like big American hero. Yeah, yeah. yeah he wants. And to be it, he loves football. <laughs> I, so I think a centerpiece of this book is the relationship between Greg yeah. and Johnny. Yeah. Also known as uh, Tommy Wiseau. Well, yes, I guess we should get that. So. Tommy and Greg are the, the real life people and the they play real the people. characters in the movie of Johnny and Mark right. respectively. Yeah. So the, the, the huge, I think for me, so for me what was really interesting in this book was that relationship. You have Greg who is a young actor, good looking young guy, he's maybe Hot 21 guy. years old. What's that? Hot guy. Hot guy. Hot guy. Certified 9 out of 10 right. any major city in the US. And he... He's like kind of your prototypical, ambitious Hollywood kid. Like he's good looking, tall, has all the things that are ready. He's American and he has all of the makings of what could be a Hollywood star potentially right. if he can learn how to act. And then opposite him, you have um, Tommy Wiseau, who is, who, is, who is dark in appearance. He's shorter. He's almost um, – he's like a little hunched over. He's clearly not American, which is in and of itself not a bad thing, but in within the context of trying to make it in Hollywood as a popularized American person that could be seen as a default or a fault, rather. Um, and so you have these two extremely opposite people coming together to form a relationship that's really – it's a beautiful relationship in my opinion. Yeah. Well, and it's the most interesting part of the book because if you were going to write a book about just about this weird guy, uh, that wouldn't be necessarily something that would be worth reading. Cause no. She, she playing weird people just around the town. Plenty um, of weird people. But like, but the the idea of someone relatable like Greg, who you kind of can you know place yourself in his spot to then be spending all this time, like multiple years, you know, having your closest friend be this this guy who's bizarre in almost every way. That that's interesting. So then you, that's what you want to read about is why. What about this guy made Greg stay friends with him and mm -hmm. keep in touch with him and you know eventually make a movie with him for uh, after all these years, and that's kind of what uh what at least half of the book is about the other half that's not about the making of the movie for me what i think drew these two people so together was how they complemented each other mm -hmm. greg had exactly what tommy wanted and vice versa and in, in, the, in the in the way that greg was again this tall good looking american guy tommy was not on the other hand tommy was fearless when right. it came to acting he was ambitious he believed in himself he had zero fear when he took the stage to act in acting classes he had undeniable self-confidence and i think that's something that pretty much anyone would find attractive in in a friend or in in, in, in any other person yeah. um, but it was even more so for greg because he was at a very interesting point in his life where like he was insecure he didn't have a job he was trying to become an actor he was dealing with a ton of rejection he had self-doubt and then he meets this guy who's like pretty much invincible from like a performance standpoint and from like a confidence standpoint so they they both filled in each other's gaps really well yeah i mean so you you see that um that greg is just a way better actor <laughs> than than tommy but um is kind of starting to get some success when he moves to la he gets mm -hmm. like an agent and he's starting to you know to, to actually get some work and he uh, makes some some reels kind of some footage to pass around and it was like he was hitting his peak right there and took him a long time to get there and was like really proud he's able to get to that point uh, than then Tommy, who has zero skill and zero things going for him, uh, kind of just copies Greg. And he's like, look at my tape. I make one, too. And yeah. I mean, it's funny because like he, he's not going to get any jobs out of it, but it took Greg a lot of hard work and a lot of commitment to get himself comfortable getting to that point. And yeah. Tommy's like, you know, grip it and rip it. Like, yeah, he makes the sag real, which is just a commercial for his other company. It was just <laughs> 
street fashion. That's a, yeah. So for those that don't know, like I did before I read this book, to get into SAG, which is the Screen Actors Guild, you either need to be the lead in a commercial or what was the other criteria? Have three three extra parts or have a credited role in some other film. Okay. So you, so you need to have some benchmark of, of acting activity, be a credited extra, be a certain level of extra in a movie, or you, if you star in a commercial, that qualifies you for SAG. So Greg, he's... Um, an extra in a couple of things and he qualifies and he gets his SAG membership um, and Greg and sorry so Greg gets the, the membership and then Tommy sees Greg get it and he says oh I want to get that too so the way he does this and this is sort of a motif in the book is he just puts cash into his dream um, and he buys a commercial for his side business and he stars in his own commercial and then he basically buys himself into SAG, into SAG. I thought that was hilarious yeah so this is kind of like the way that Tommy sort of goes about getting the things that he wants is that he kind of just he somehow and, that, and that's one of the one of the parts that's left gray even after reading the book he's like it's not really clear how he has all this money because the movie as even as a small budget movie would still cost you know multiple millions of dollars and he does he seems to show no expense at least when he's filming the with the, with getting the parts of the movie that he wants to right. <laughs> in there he shows no uh, fear of paying for whatever it costs yeah I feel like the number I have in my head is six million. Does yeah, that, sound right? I, I think, that might yeah. have been the book. I, I think like six million dollars with the production, maybe five, five. but millions of dollars, yeah. which is in not just pocket change. Yeah, so something that uh, something that you know a regular person on the street wouldn't be able to just shell out, and and with no with almost no second thought. So he must have more money than that. Um, but so frugal with other things too, like yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, water, for instance. Yeah, couldn't pay for water. Wouldn't pay for. Um, he wouldn't pay any of the people that were working for him. Yeah. He was stingy in all the wrong places, yeah. and then but then we shell out and shell out for two cameras or which is just else. unnecessary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they built they built an entire roof set, um, just a couple of stories below where there was an actual roof yeah. that they could have used for their set. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. So in this book, they they shoot many many scenes on the on this quote unquote roof, and there's just an actual roof they could shoot on, but right. instead yeah, they, they build a roof. They build alleyways. When they build alleyways. There, there's alleyways outside the the uh, studio lot and stuff like that. Um, but this is just Tommy's idea of how you how you go about getting things is you gotta, you know, flash the cash and then you, you can just and then if, if that just lends, uh, you know, realism and uh, just makes it more more worthwhile. Like if you have if, if you if, built if, it, if this costs money, then you know that it's like. Right. So, so what do you think that says that that Tommy, who's just pursuing the um, his view of what the American dream is, thinks that means you just throw money at problems? Uh, Maybe that's a d- deeper mean, than a Tommy Wiseau thought. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, he's probably been you know told this told this by a lot of people. But I mean, he's he's an old guy. It's not like and he has actually made money doing something. Yeah, something. something. Real estate, so he's got he, some, some of it is at least working for him. You can't really be uh, hating on it that hard at this point. No, you can't. I mean, and he he if the story that we read about Tommy in the book is true, he really defied a lot of odds to get yeah. to where he is, which I think was inspirational. Yeah, um, I think, I think Tommy's overall the way he has a vision and, and then acts on it and brings it into the world is an inspiration for any creative, um, anyone that has an idea. I feel like you can so easily get dwindled in self doubt and not wanting to do it and what if this or what if that, and no matter how bad the room, which is the movie that Tommy makes, is, he did it. He made the movie. He yeah. got it in theaters. He got it shot, and he did it against all odds. He's not American. He came here as a kid or a young guy, and he made the money, and he shot the movie, and he starred in it again. The uh, the opinions are out there about whether or not it's a good movie, um, but you, no one can deny the fact that he made it, and that that in and of itself, to me, I found a very inspirational part of this book. Yeah, I mean, there are lessons. I mean, he's he's not obviously not a perfect guy, but there are there are lessons to be learned from the type of uh, behavior that he exhibits, um, for sure. Were, but um, yeah, I forgot what I was gonna say. He, yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, if you could, if you want it that bad, like I guess that if you if you're looking for something to learn from Tommy, that would be probably the main thing. Is I would say is that he does, at the very least, go after what he fucking wants. Yeah. What do you guys think about Tommy's um, the way he treats Greg? He he sort of coddles him in a way, and then is mean to him. It almost feels like a relationship between like two lovers that more than it does like a friendship at times what do you guys make of that relationship um yeah it did it, 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 it seemed like like tommy wanted someone to be close with so badly that he he then greg reaches out to him and they become friends and then at that point that it's like you know you, you can't lose him 
Yeah, I think Tommy definitely does not realize that uh, you know a relationship is a two way street kind of thing. Tommy definitely does not see that. Um, I mean, there's there's ways he's very good to Greg. I mean, he lets him live in his apartment, and which allows Greg to get his real start. Um, but he wasn't doing that for Greg. He was doing that for himself because mm-hmm. that's the relationship he wanted with Greg. Um, I mean, the, the the part of the book where he you know kicks him out of his car um, or, or Greg gets out of the car uh, is like abuse. Yeah. So the whole thing kind of felt like uh, not that Greg wasn't that didn't want to be there, but like kind of like you're like like you're over at your friend's house and their parents are arguing and you're like uh, I, don't, I really want to get out of here but like <laughs> you, it's too awkward and stuff at some point so you kind of just let go with it and then hope that you don't have to talk about it anymore and then you, you try to go find back. the dog and just yeah, pet the dog you go in the other room play video games or something <laughs> so um, so like he realized that he was getting something from Tommy but at points he was like this is ridiculous I don't know if this is always this is what I really had planned but I guess it kind of worked out in the end I guess to a certain yeah. extent Tommy provided a lot of things that Greg needed. He really, Greg needed an apartment. Greg needed someone to support his dream. He needed eventually an apartment in LA. And Greg, you know, Tommy um, gave Greg a lot of those things. It kind of almost felt like, I've, I've never experienced this, um, but you hear about like sugar daddies and yeah. sugar mamas, like that's kind of the vibe I got. Yeah, Greg is also like looking for um, validation, right? I mean, a lot, of, a lot of, he doesn't talk about his personal life that much. Right. Um, he doesn't have that many other relationships. He's got his other like best friend who's literally just my hippie friend. Doesn't even have a name throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Then he just complains. Yeah. He complains about his mom. Like my mommy doesn't accept me for being an actor. I mean, that's, right. that's like half of Greg's. Well, yeah, and all this time he talks about his mom. I'm like I'm kind of on the mom's side for most of it. I'm like, you can't. I mean, maybe this is just how I was raised. But like you're going to move to Los Angeles and you're 20 and you don't have any job prospects. You're not an actor at this point. You've been in, you've, all you've done is modeled. You're going to move to Los Angeles. I mean, that to me seems like a bad idea. Mm-hmm. Let's put it yeah. that. And then that's what, that's basically the uh, the side the point his mom's coming from. And uh, Greg at the, Greg doesn't want to hear it. You know, he kind of mm-hmm. just goes and then lives at Tommy's apartment. That goes back to Tommy Tommy being like a yes man, right? He kind of needed that in his life. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like we're getting um kind of deeper psychoanalyzing. We should bring up that this is like a hilarious book. I mean, we're getting serious <laughs> with it, true. but like. Yeah. I laughed out loud kind of while reading multiple times. What parts did you find funny? Or fun, what, what were uh, the most funny? I think any time... Uh, so my personal favorite throughout is... I think Tommy just says ridiculous things. Um, I don't think that I know that. Um, but <laughs> Greg addresses Tommy's method for casting, um, which... <laughs> For for the men involved having to get naked, he needed to see their ass on camera. He's he needed to, to, he needed to know that it's good ass. Hey, yeah. you're, you're you're not getting on this. You're not getting on this movie unless I see some cheeks. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and That's with the girls, he would just like verbally assault them. Right? <laughs> just just start yelling things like, "Your sister is lesbian now. What do you do? <laughs> Act." What a crazy thing to put on someone. Like, all right, react to your sister, and it's not that your sister told you she's le- lesbian. She is now lesbian. Like something yeah, just yeah. happened. She got a yeah. spell put on her. Yeah. Now she's lesbian. Yeah, we flipped that switch that everyone that everyone has. We flipped that switch. We flipped that switch. The lesbian switch has been flipped. Now react to how you, it just happened to your sister. So, Crazy. I mean, the fact that he thinks that's okay. Like, and it's not even. Uh, we don't get any inclination at any point that like Tommy thinks what he's saying is a joke. Like he yeah. he's taking everything he does seriously. Yeah, the, just all the like the split second decisions he makes and what he decides can be shot and and the things that he's is that think that that are ridiculous are make almost no sense and the, the whole thing is kind of funny to me where he he you know sets up the the roof the roof scene or the roof the set mm-hmm. the roof set breaks it all down which is like you know six people working for a whole day and then does some other stuff and then goes back and needs to re reshoot stuff on the roof and then he's like people were like oh we just broke that down you know yesterday and that's that's like Ten thousand dollars worth of man hours to, mm-hmm. worth to set back up, and he's like, "Oh, we got we're a big time movie here. We gotta we can do this. We want." Yeah, I prefer people hours over man hours. Just uh, oh, yeah. it's twenty seventeen. Sorry, everyone. Willies. Damn, yo, Steve. <laughs> I'm playing. Just dropping the hammer on Zach. Respect it though. We need to be we need to be thoughtful. <laughs> yeah. That's Have you guys ever three white males running yeah. a podcast? Have Rick you guys ever thought about trying to be an actor? Uh. Kind of the thing I th- I always I'm like I think I would be good at it, but I'm never gonna do it. Yeah, no, I have I thought. I mean, everyone's thought about it, but no, I I've never thought I'd be that good at it. To be honest. Uh, yeah, I I've thought about it. I've done a few things. I did a play in summer camp. I was um in Peter Pan, yeah. and I was the little brother. 
like okay. the little baby brother, even though I was the biggest person on the stage. <laughs> yeah. I weird. thought about being a, a filmmaker for a short period of time. I, I took some film classes in college. Um, Brian here was actually the star of a of a short silent movie. Oh, right, dude, I forgot about that. Yeah. Is that do you still have that? I'm sure I do on some external hard drive we somewhere. Get, we get, should get that up on Instagram or on the YouTube <laughs> channel or something. Yeah. Also, it's not uh, our first creative endeavor together. That's funny. Yeah. Um, we um, we should post on uh, we should post on the the, the GRC kind of website um, uh, a copy of the edit. Oh, the edit is true. The edit. That might be your the spike ball edit. Yeah. yeah oh, the, true. The that, might be, ball edit. that might be your best acting performance. I'm not that play, was, playing yourself, but we're, we're making reference to a um, I guess an Instagram video of of uh, Brian pulling some shirtless it, stunts. Hey, 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 for sure, call it an edit. The edit. It's I'm sorry, edit. it's an edit. Yeah, <laughs> the greatest background music of all time. Um, yeah, slow mo, of course. Oh right, that song was actually. Good. It's so funny you say that. I haven't thought about that video in so long. I was Liar. on Instagram like 1 a.m. last Liar. night, and uh, I pulled it up. Broke a thousand views. Really? Yeah, I feel like that's a lot for an Instagram video, at least for me. That's definitely a lot. Yeah. I th- so on the acting thing, the one thing I'll say is I, and I did UCB Upright Citizens Brigade. I did the 101 class, which is improv. Definitely want to do 201. It's awesome. Recommend anyone check it out. 101 or one on one? 101. Oh. Like UCB 101. Sure. Improv 101. Um, I've always thought like a Disney Channel bully would be my role. Like in like, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. Like Biff or something. Yeah. yeah like Bizarre Vark on Disney Channel. I don't know if you guys know that show, but. You, you beat up Ned in like Ned's DJ. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like push someone into a locker. You crush Ned, dude. Get out of my way, loser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like one dimensional. Like he doesn't. Like even have anything that he wants, he's just mean. He's just mean to be mean. His dad maybe be just him. acting straight like Tommy on the set. Yeah, yeah, just bullying people. Tommy's a bully, a little bit. Were you a bully in real life? Nah, I don't think so. I mean, someone else might say different, but I think I was. Um, I was cool with everyone. You know, I like I played sports and stuff. Yeah, and I was so, definitely friends with bullies. I don't think I ever. I was definitely like an accessory to bullying mm, for sure. Um, I was. I probably got picked on a little bit. I tried to be funny too much, and I think as a core, as a like by trying to be funny, I would hurt people's yeah, feelings. Yeah, you want people to like you more yeah, than anything. Exactly, and like I just wanted people to laugh and and people to you know think I was cool and stuff. Right. And so, by in that process, I probably cracked some jokes that made people not feel great. Yeah, I mean sometimes humor, it's the cheap way out, but it's at someone else's expense, right? right. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, so, so, so I had already seen the the movie. What did you? What did? How did you? Have both of you seen the movie or no? Have I seen the room? The room? No. Yeah, the room. I've seen the room. Yes. I have. Okay. So, and did you watch it before you read the book or after? after? After. I watched. I watched the room before I read the Disaster Artist. Okay. So, so did you have any any points where you read about something that you saw in the movie and it? gave you any more clarity or any or like revealed something that that you could did not understand the first time i think for just some of the like behind the scenes production stuff when they're doing a scene or for for example greg's on the roof and he says she's at a hospital on guerrero street and then greg kind of goes into how that was like the 70th time he said the line right and he said the guerrero street thing just to get a different reaction out of tommy right because tommy had such an issue you know, remember, remember the, the lines that he wrote. Yeah. Right. So little things like that. It's like, oh, like you watch the movie, you're like, why would anyone say that? And then Greg explains why someone would say that. Yeah. You're talking about the hospital and you give the address to the hospital. That's what people always do. I always do that when I'm <laughs> describing the hospitals. You don't say the name of the hospital. You say the hospital on off the highway. You yeah. Know? You know, I was on the hospital on Frost Lane. Yeah. People know that one. Yeah. yeah. I um I chose to watch the movie after reading the book because uh, I think on the back flap or whatever, it it explicitly says like you don't have to have seen the movie uh-huh. and, and I kind of wanted to test that mm-hmm. right um, you kind of watch you, you see the movie a lot by reading the book I mean yeah. it hits on all the main things but it, it was good after to watch the movie and be like mm-hmm, yep I know that right. and there is little things that um, there's con- there's a t- just the movie's riddled with continuity issues yes. that so bad. you would otherwise miss just because like 99% of the movies you watch have at least some baseline continuity to the point that like the horrible continuity you miss it because your assumption is a movie can never be that bad so right. things like during a, a party scene like you know you look out the window it's daylight and then it's pitch black in the next one yeah, and then so the camera angle changes and it's daylight again yeah some stuff that's so obvious you're not even really like yeah. you can't even you don't, it almost doesn't even register yeah um, it's so off that it doesn't feel off right i i remember laughing out loud even when i watched it by myself too the tape recorder scene. So, <laughs> so Tommy has now he has now found out for himself that his his wife or girlfriend is cheating on him, 
and uh, he so now in order to prove it to other people or I don't know he has to record her saying something so he pulls out a tape recorder and his tape out of his jacket pocket which he carries with him all the time and uh, records uh, her you know admitting it to her mother or her, her, her to Mark yeah. and then plays the plays the recording back like in the next scene it's like literally 10 seconds later in the movie and the recording is different than what she said <laughs> which is just, then you uh, record something totally different yeah I mean and like and that's that's got to be Tommy because any of the other people there he has a full full staff yeah. of, of uh, competent filmmakers mm -hmm. who at least have worked on other projects that would pick yeah. it up. And that's what that's what I don't get. Tommy's angle. He wants to have real Hollywood movie, and so he pays to have a real Hollywood movie. And he has real Hollywood like yeah. set people, right? Pros, and they're pros, there, like pros, exactly. And like let them do their job and he's like no I want to have a real Hollywood movie with real Hollywood crew but I still make all decisions yeah. he constantly gets in the way of the people he hired yeah. I like this I like this quote right here I thought this really defined Tommy uh, this is Greg speaking what made him so confident I was desperately curious to discover that it wasn't his acting obviously which was extraordinarily bad he was simply magically uninhibited the only person in our class, or any class I'd ever taken for that matter, whom I actually look forward to watching perform. The rest of us were toying with chemistry sets, and he was lighting the entire lab on fire. I thought I like that because it's like you do these things, and and then people are like scared, like it's natural, like you have this self doubt, and this dude is has every reason to have those feelings amplified by ten. Yeah, he's just ripping it. One of the like the the most relatable, or like the most. The part that I liked Mark the most in the whole book is him watching Johnny for the first time and not like laughing at him, being like, "I gotta meet that guy." Mm -hmm. Him being like, "That that guy, whatever he, whatever's going on with him, I need to at least find out what what his deal is," and not and not like trying to avoid him in the hallway, which totally. is what I would have done. He was drawn to him. He said, well, yeah. "This dude has a vibe, and I'm trying to catch it." Yeah, I'm trying to catch that vibe. So, which, uh, um, what was your favorite like mess up in the movie? Did oh you guys? God. Did you guys see the Ooh. spoon in the spoon in the picture frame? I saw yeah. the spoon. Yeah, they tell a story about that too. The, the set designers or the costume designers, whatever, had like just no time, and they just right. ran out with like minimal money because Tommy wouldn't shell out yeah. on <laughs> would buy two cameras, but wouldn't give the costume designer any budget to it. Um, so they just bought stock photo. Yes. Yeah, so Didn't they take the photos of the spoons? I don't think so. No, no. no I think they said they were stock photos. Stock. Like they bought picture frames and like whatever pictures whatever came was in, in the it. frames. Oh, and, and they were just a bunch of spoons. So in in the room, there's a framed picture of a spoon on the table. And what, don't people like throw spoons or something? When yeah, they that's see what it? they do with the screenings now. I think is uh, whenever the spoon mm -hmm. picture is in the frame, people throw plastic spoons from the, yeah. from the seats. I guess there's like a series of rituals, like viewer rituals, like that. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. I think that's an interesting point for those who who haven't read the book or don't know about the room. It's it's really a multimedia experience. So, like, one, you have the book, The Disaster Artist, which we all read. Then you have the movie, which is The Room, which is what the book's about. And then on top of that, you have this whole live experience where people, and we're here in New York City, so there's a lot of people in Brooklyn and the surrounding areas who, who um, people will say, like, are hipsters or whatever, or into this type of art. Like, right. I don't really like that term, hipster, but whatever. Um, point being is that people sell out theaters all around New York City area to go watch this together. They go, they drink, sometimes Greg and Tommy yeah, show, up. show up and do speeches and there's all of these rituals during the film that people do as they're watching it. Like they'll yell certain things or if there's a funny line coming up, they'll all say it in harmony like, you're tearing me apart. There's also the, there's the part where he, Johnny like looks, he's either looking off screen to read the line from someone or he's like gathering himself so he looks down and it, in the movie it looks like he's looking down at the corner of the screen right. and people will go will run up to the front of the of the theater and they'll look like do something weird at the corner of the screen so it looks like he's looking at them that's doing awesome. the weird thing while <laughs> during the movie yeah that's awesome I, uh, I guess back to your original question though what's my favorite um, oh, right. mess up is uh, not even a continuity issue but the scene where he goes into the flower shop mm. yeah. yeah just how do you I don't even get what's going on there they packed like four scenes of dialogue into a 10 second scene he like walks into a very very small flower shop directly right. up to the counter and she's like wearing sunglasses yeah wearing sun just in the middle of the day. oh hi Johnny I didn't see you there like oh I didn't know that was you yeah it's, it's her favorite customer but she yeah. didn't recognize him in the first three seconds <laughs> yeah, how do you not recognize Tommy first of all and the exchange is instant and like as he's walking away you're my favorite customer yeah. like, bye bye yeah she's got the 
flowers waiting for me. So weird. Think about if you, next time you see someone, you're like, oh, what's up, man? How you doing? Good. Oh, I didn't realize it was you. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. You just address them because you recognize yeah, them. Yeah. Weird. Um, I th- For the, some of the mess ups, like, um, or just some of the lack of, like, like the fights, like, the fights were so weird to me. Like, they're, yeah. they're doing these weird, like, wrist grabs on each other, and they're just, like, it's just such a bizarre fight, and... Um, yeah, Mark even uh, Greg excuse me, says that he like they're taking so many takes of these fights and he just like can't even get a muster up the energy to like put a even pretend to fight Johnny right. at this point. So he just like and it shows in the movie like he does not look like he wants to be there at all. So tired. Uh, the sex scenes are obviously brutal. Brutal. I mean, just just, a lot just of ass. Uh, coming out firing. Johnny comes out firing, firing in the movie. Two sex scenes in the first ten minutes of this Same. movie. Flaming hot, flame is sexy. That's what I gotta say. <laughs> and he he he's aiming so high. Yeah, I he's mean, completely yeah, that, missing any area that would actually be conducive to real sex. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't know. Yeah, who knows? I, I definitely. I mean, I've know. looked at a couple diagrams online. And I've seen I've seen a couple diagrams. <laughs> Health class. I love this quote. This is Greg speaking about what Johnny told him. Or I always mess up the characters Johnny in the real Tommy, name. Yeah, yeah Johnny is, Tommy stuff. Yeah. Johnny, so this is Tommy, whatever. Greg says, as he said to me one morning on the way to the set, and now this is Tommy speaking, we are shooting now for two weeks. You know what that means? People in Hollywood know we are fully loaded. And I, I just love the term fully loaded. Like in his mind, he's like, I have $10 million cash to make a movie. Now people know I'm fully loaded. Yeah. I thought that was just like a funny like term. I feel like you're kind of like a fully loaded guy. Me? Yeah. I, like, I mean, I like being fully loaded, whether it's cash-wise, which I'm not. Always, ever. Um, sometimes food-wise, I'm fully loaded. Ooh, have no, some good food in the yeah, cabinet. Yeah. Um, did you buy that? Did you buy that cutoff? That double cutoff right now. I, I double want to look <laughs> for the for the viewers. Shakeman's rocking double cutoffs right now. Oh, oh this whole thing. This whole thing. <laughs> no, honestly, though, this is how it came. Um, you know, I got the I got the forest green sweater. The, I got those the, are two items, though, right? These two separate shirts. Okay. I'm. That, that button down collar with the short sleeve with the, the long sleeve underneath that's sewn in. That you, oh. <laughs> that's a second grade stable. I'm not even going to sit over here on, on the podcast and act like I'm a fashion mogul. I've gotten a little more into dressing since I moved to New York City, but it's all just basic stuff from Zara and nice. Uniqlo. Shout out. Sponsor the pod. <laughs> Shout out. Um, into fast fashion? Nothing sustainable? or What's fast fashion? It's uh, like a H and M Zara. Yeah, I think like fast Uniqlo. food, like affordable but still nice. Yeah, they uh, they like update their their stock like every like couple weeks, and it's always different. I'm stuff. into these stores, but no, this is how this came, and this is a, like a, a short sleeve flannel, and um, I got the forest green hoodie. I actually have like the same hoodie with the sleeves on. I have so <laughs> I have so much. The huge pr- proportion of my wardrobe is that color green. It's a good green. I need to to diversify my my colors. I need yeah. to do more of it I, because I. You realize you have colors, like as a you have colors as a dude. Yeah. Like depending on your eye and hair color, you have right. color, right? Yeah. I mean, I've never necessarily thought about it that way, but I can at least. Like, I'm not a red guy. Okay, you, do you see red. me in like a bright red shirt? No. Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. Maybe I don't really see anyone in a bright red shirt. Mm. Besides Greg well, Sestro. I like that buffalo plaid flannel sometimes. The black and red. Jacket. True. Is it too early for final thoughts? Are we there yet? I don't want to jump ahead, but I don't know. You're the timekeepers. I'm the timekeeper, Steve, co-host. Um, we're at um, we're at like 35 minutes. All right. I figure trim five off in either side. Yeah, I mean, so it's a much shorter book than Barbarian Days, so I think it's yeah. safe yeah. to say that it's going to have a little bit less discussion. Yeah, I mean, this is like a two-sitting. I mean, I, I read the book in two-sitting. I'm not saying it's a two-sitting book. I, I went on a vacation, so I was on a plane. Where'd you but, go? Um, I went down to Tampa, Florida. Actually, it was not a vacation. It was a work trip, but cool. um, <laughs> but it was a vacation, too. Yeah. Uh, played some golf. Anyway, yeah, so I read it on the plane. You can crush it, and um, it's an easy read. It's lighthearted, and um, I don't, this is morphing into my final thoughts, by the way. Is this uh, your final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, even if you guys don't do yours after, just let me get no, my I opinions think we can do out there. Uh, I think it's yeah, appropriate. It's, a, it's an easy book to read. Um, it's rewarding because you're crushing through pages, and you're having a good time while doing it. Um, definitely the kind of book that like you're trying to um, put between a, a Barbarian Days, which we just went on uh, last week, or last episode, and, and the next episode, which will be... Um, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, Sapiens. 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 Yeah. By Doctor Yuval Harari. Harari sounds good. Uh, sure. I'll tell you right now. But Keep um, going final thoughts. I'll get the name of the book. But yeah, definitely the uh, the kind of book you're trying to sandwich between them. A little light read. Yeah. Um, and kind of the 
the whole experience around it that it is a book about the making of a movie and mm-hmm. soon and they are currently making a movie about this book that's right. about the making of a movie right. um, but tons of, of YouTube content out there um, of Tommy oh, Wiseau yeah. just being Tommy which if you have not watched yet maybe we'll throw some links yeah, in yeah even if you're not willing to commit to that to watching a whole movie that you think is going to be yeah. pretty bad there's I mean there's 20 different compilations of the of the funniest things Tommy says and the, all the methods from the movie yeah. that are right on YouTube and um He's the most uh, what it comes what it comes down to is Tom is the most ridiculous person I've ever ever heard of and I would love to meet him. Yeah. All right, I'll take a little final thoughts. We'll give you. I was going to say before that, what, what oh. did you guys think? Of, so this is the first book that we've suggested in the club that had like a another video element to it. What, was that it? Was that a go over as a success to you? Yeah, honestly, and that was going to be part of my my final right. thoughts. So nice, clean segue. Um, this book is a multimedia experience. Yeah. You have the book. Like you have sometimes you just have a book and there's a book. This was a book, it's a movie, there's YouTube content. I found myself for the first time having ever read I've, I've never done this before, reading a book, pulling out my phone and going to YouTube in the middle of reading a book because they talk about scenes and he's like, like I need to see it now. Yeah. He's like, Oh, in the in the rooftop scene and they do this, this, and this and I and I immediately watch that YouTube scene while I'm reading the book and I'm like, Oh, this is exactly what he's talking about. Yeah. So it's uh it's cool. And there's a community around the book. So you talk to people and it's kind of like, it's not so well known where everyone's read it. So if you meet someone else who knows it, it's kind of like a funny inside joke. Yeah. So there's so many layers. You got like the book, the movie, people that know about the book and the movie. So yeah, yeah it's totally. And did you know that going in when you picked this book that it was such a well, widespread I assume that thing? Talk about the. I th- I actually was surprised at how much of it wasn't about the movie itself. I thought it was going to be basically just a retelling of the production process and the, after that, but there was a lot more about it that was had to do with Greg and Tommy Julius because to, when you watch the movie you don't really know that they knew each other for you know five years beforehand yeah. mm-hmm. um, and that's one of the things that I thought would actually made it you know a more worthwhile read was that you can really see there's a lot to be there's a lot there about the relationship you can see your, you can see parts of yourself in, in Greg and Johnny and I'm sure everyone has a friend who's done some stuff or is uh, behaved in a way that's not a full <laughs> a full Tommy but you know uh, Tommy-esque yeah, but like it has little bits of Tommy in them, and you and you can sort of, uh, you know, relate to that, and that's kind of what I was trying to bring to the group. I was, and I also wanted to share the movie. I've, that, that's always that's been one of the, the things about it that I like the most is that you can really just sit down with a bunch of friends and watch this movie, mm-hmm. and it's 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 a really good time, even better time than watching a really good movie with people because if you're doing that, you know, you have to you want to pay attention, you want to see what's going on in the movie. But this is like a whole group experience. You're all yelling, you know, funny stuff out the whole time. You can point out all the, you know, the Stuff they fuck up. It's a good time. For sure. All right. Were those, are those your final thoughts, or do you want to add on? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, we can do an affi- we can do like a more official final thoughts right now. You did your final thoughts. Yeah, yeah I did my final thoughts. I'm, I'm brewing though. If you recall, you're gonna have to come up with a one to ten rating. Oh, no right. round numbers. No round no numbers. Round numbers. So if you do round numbers, you're never allowed back on the podcast. Sure. That's Steve's rule, not mine. Do, what if I could I do a point zero? Is that that one? It's a lazy way out, is what we. Yeah, think. no, it's, yeah. we want we want because. Think right. about the difference between a seven one and a seven nine. No, I agree that that's worth it, but I think that dis- that not allowing a a, a a point zero is kind of yeah. But what I'm saying is like you're thinking in like tenths, like imagine hundredths. <laughs> yeah, like, just, we want we want to, no, we want to add some some of that discrepancy in there. Let, let me drop some final thoughts. You have final thoughts. I'll do final uh, thoughts, yeah, and you, you do go. final thoughts, and we'll do scores. Yeah. yeah, sure. Final thoughts. Word. You did your final thoughts. Yeah. yeah. I'm good. Great book. Thanks, dude. Great choice. And it's, yeah, it's such a multimedia experience. You have the book, which is funny and interesting in itself. It really sheds light on a, uh, same thing with Barbarian Days. Like, it really puts pen to paper on a male relationship in an interesting way, which, like, maybe we should start reading, like, <laughs> the books that are not about that. But, like, <laughs> we, uh, yeah, it puts pen to paper on, like, these, this, these dudes' relationship in a really interesting way. Um, I loved reading about, you know the day-to-day life of someone pursuing acting i've always found acting interesting and what it would be like to pursue that so i found that really cool Mm -hmm. i love reading about this guy being basically our age in the year 2000 which although it was 17 years ago yeah that's a that's a real not to interrupt you but that's a real interesting time jump now you look back at like the late 90s early 2000s uh, it's a different world to be yeah just even jump back you know 15 years from now i think that's a it's a weird it's a weird time it was a weird because you were so in between your yeah. 70s, 80s disconnected world. You know your town, and that's it. Right. 
to now the 90s the world was coming way smaller right. but it's still distinctly pre-internet so distinctly like he's not he's not signing up for gigs online he's not emailing even no he's in backstage he's still making telephone calls yeah, and stuff. he goes to uh he goes to a kinkos and like oh, yeah. the guy sells him like some under What's the a counter kinkos? kind of product that's like yo i'll sell you these labels that have every agent's right. yeah. address on it yeah it's like crazy it's like, so oh, my guy you got the internet <laughs> that that and from a time like in terms of it being a time piece like that i thought that was cool yeah and yeah, it's just like it, reading this book is so much more than just, oh, I read this book. You now kind of opened up to this whole little cultural phenomenon around this movie called The Room. So I'm, I'm, I really liked it. It was funny. Um, it was honest. It was insightful. Um, and it was overall a really, really strong book. Yeah. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it. It was a little bit of a different experience for me because I had already seen the movie. So this was more of an explainer kind of thing. It wasn't really opening my eyes to something there. So I'm not sure that I had as much of a... Like, like wholehearted like just being absorbed by the whole thing it was it was cool there's a lot there's a lot there in the relationship i think that um when you look at the way that greg you know latches on to johnny in this way or tommy excuse me um you know you want to f- find out why because that just seems like a weird weird choice I, I don't know if i would have ever made it so to find out why he you know thinks that this is the, the way to go to get his, to get you know his dream of being an actor mm-hmm. you know that that's uh that's worth reading about and yeah to open your uh, people's eyes up to the to the movie and how much fun that can be is is a it's a good read I I, I agree um yeah so I don't I think that I don't want to necessarily say this out loud but I think that I had the two highest rated overall books so far out of, we've been all through almost twice wow and I think I have, I have people like my books the best it's all about that that like net promoter score or something yeah <laughs> that NPR that NPS is hot yeah my Z score what was the first book you picked it that was picked? the Nazi drug book. Uh, was it called Blitz? That's Blitz, a, Blitz, yeah. I'm not sure if we're gonna have that one on uh, on the show, but if anyone looking for a good World War II read, Blitz is pretty. Yeah, cool. Blitz is good. Drugs. Um, we we also didn't really have a we didn't have a full. That was a little bit of a uh, a shortened meeting. We didn't necessarily all rate that one, but for the, for those who don't know, we're also in a book club outside of Grammar Street Reading Club right. with a bunch of friends. Kind of served as the inspiration for this. And we typically do like three week, two month cycles yeah, where we'll either. read a book and then talk about it. Um, and we do round robin picking. Um, Just like some millennial dudes sitting around on a couch. Yeah, some millennial dudes chilling. Yeah, people love hearing about that. And yeah, so so Zach had picked two great books so far. Yeah. I Blitz, think Blitz uh, what was the first one called? Blitz, Blitz was yeah. the first one and then The Disaster Artist, which, yeah, high ratings. Oh, my numerical rating, I think, I was, I was going to give it like a 7.8 seven, or 7.7. Seven, seven. Is that your, is that your Boom. answer? Boom. You just dropped that. Yeah, that's my answer. Wow, that's your score seven eight seven eight out of a uh, hard to hear on first a ten point zero uh, scale on ten o scale on a fifteen point scale. You want to talk about that seven eight? Give us some um, insight behind the yeah, numbers. Yeah, I mean, I, I th- the writing was nothing to like you know yeah. call home about it. it. It's it's this guy Greg writing about. He's not a writer; he's an actor. Sure. And this Tom Bessel probably gave him some some uh, artistic flourishes and things like that, some guidance. And I think that that accounts. We didn't really talk about, it, but the book is written chopped up in the beginning where he tells one chapter about the production one chapter about him meeting Tommy and you know learning to you know live with him the and courting of the relationship yes the, yeah. so the, they go back and forth until the two timelines meet up at the end where or they don't really meet up but he, the, until until the relationship gets to the point where they're going to decide to make the movie and then that that's where mm-hmm. the movie part would start which is the beginning of the book um, so that was kind of cool but it's not like a crazy no, no twist it's not, mm-hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't really he explains the relationship but he doesn't really give me anything where I'm like, oh, like, mm-hmm. you know, like an enlightening sort of thing. It's it just, it's, it's nice to, to hear a story about two guys that, you know, grew to, grew to love each other. Yeah, I think on last week's episode, we were talking about with Barbarian Days, um, the idea of of great writing yeah. and a great story, yeah. right? And they don't always overlap and they can exist kind of together apart. Yeah. It's kind of my opinion. This is a great story. It's not, you know, incredible writing. Don't yeah. pick up the book if you're looking to be wowed by like the prose of Greg Sestero, but you're looking to laugh and have kind of a lighthearted read. Yeah. Pick it up. That's what it is, really. Score? Oh, my score. Um, yeah, I'm at like a, a seven five, seven six, seven six, seven six. I laughed a lot, so I needed that. Strong. Nice. I would give it if I read the book alone, I'll give the book as it is like a seven seven. Like just like good book, solid read. But when you include all the multimedia elements and the introduction to this cultural phenomenon that comes with it, right. I'm gonna go ahead and give it an eight one. Let's go. There you go. I'm gonna give it a strong eight one. So Marcel perk up over here at eight one. He's like, Oh, Marcel, you like that eight one? 
Have you read this book? No, I've not read the book. Did you know what the room? Have you heard of any of this? The room? Yeah, yeah, I've read the movie. I've read the movie. I've seen the movie. Oh, you've seen the movie? Yeah. What'd you think? Synesthesia over here, reading movies. Yeah, reading movies. The movie was fantastic. I thought it was uh, extremely confusing. Very. Marcel thinks the movie is extremely confusing. Yeah, hard to uh, hard to follow, but but that's that's kind of what makes it a thing. 